So how many of you out there have had something so catastrophic happen to you that in an instant your life was changed forever? Show of hands. Well, my husband Tom and I have. Even though it was a terrible ordeal in the beginning, it uncovered a forgotten miracle cure that had been lost almost for a hundred years. And it could turn out that this will save thousands, if not millions of lives. My guest today is Stephanie Strathy. Named one of the 50 most influential people in healthcare by Time Magazine, she's one of the top female scientists worldwide by Research.com. Canadian-born, infectious disease specialist who's focused most of her career on HIV prevention research in underserved, marginalized populations. I haven't finished with her resume. Associate Dean of Global Health Sciences, Harold Simon, Distinguished Professor at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine, and co-director at the Center for Innovative Phage Applications and Therapeutics. Many know her as the Super Bug Slayer. And one who has to be thankful is her husband. As you'll soon hear, he was dying from a bacterial infection that resisted all modern medicine could throw at it. And he's not alone. Superbugs could take down 10 million people by the year 2050. What did Stephanie do? She rallied her colleagues and they used a 100-year-old treatment called phage therapy. She saved his life and she might very well help you keep yours. And she and her husband have co-authored a book called The Perfect Predator. This is Chatter That Matters with Tony Chapman, presented by RBC. Uh, Stephanie Strathy, welcome to Chatter That Matters. Thanks very much for having me, Tony. I loved your book. The title is The Perfect Predator and a Scientist's Race to Save Her Husband from a Deadly Superbug. And I talked about your credentials in the opening of the show, but just what is the area of science that you specialize in? Well, I was trained as an infectious disease epidemiologist at the University of Toronto. I did all my training there. And back in the day when I was uh, doing my schooling, no, not many people knew what an epidemiologist was. But certainly with the COVID pandemic, um, it's uh, uh, an area now that most people know that we study the distribution and patterns of diseases and risk factors. And in my case, I've focused on HIV and related infections among substance using populations and sex workers. And uh, I certainly was not an expert in antimicrobial resistance or AMR as it's known. How did Canada lose a talent like yours? I mean, you're shooting it out of the park in Toronto. You went to Vancouver. You're doing some breakthrough work. I know that you're still involved in Canada in some part, but most of your effort now is down in the States. Why is that? Well, it was actually really heartbreaking. Um, my first husband uh, lost his job and I was offered this fantastic position at Johns Hopkins University. And when I turned to my supervisor at the University of British Columbia and said, is there anything that you can do to keep me? Um, he just kind of looked at me and said, no, I can't compete with that. I can't really fault UBC. Um, certainly, there was limited resources to be able to, you know, retain people. But Canada also doesn't spend a lot of research money um, in, in terms of HIV prevention. I had more in my research portfolio at Johns Hopkins when I started there than all of Canada spent on AIDS research across the country. Um, so... Um, it just shows you the magnitude of difference. And is it possible for a smaller country? Is there examples around the world where there are countries that punch outside their weight class that they might not have the scale of the United States, but they still find a way to invest in where they think science really can matter? Well, there are examples. Um, I think they're specific to diseases that the country is is concerned about. So the UK, for example, um, and Australia have um, invested a lot in antimicrobial resistance. And certainly that is one of the biggest threats to human health in our lifetime. It's thought to be a more immediate threat than climate change. And um, finally, Canada has woken up and a recent announcement was made by Health Canada that they are going to be investing considerable resources in this area. And uh, I, for one, am very happy about that. I wrote an op-ed in the Globe and Mail when our book came out to say, look, um, phage therapy um, was actually discovered by a French Canadian. The French actually take credit for him rather than Canada. And so we really need to claim uh, this back for Canada and um, to use it to um, thwart the threat of superbugs. So talk to me about superbugs, because the numbers that you use in your book are frightening. And as you just said, this could be a bigger threat 
in the near term than climate change. So just present how serious this is for our population. And then we can start focusing on some of the breakthrough work you and your colleagues are doing to, uh, to hopefully counter it. The first really good estimates of the number of people dying from superbug infections came out in about 2022, um, and they were based on data from 2019, so right before the COVID pandemic. And it was found that about 5 million people globally are dying from superbug infections every year. And that was surprising to people because that's more than HIV, TB, or malaria. And it's thought by the year 2050, which isn't that far away, one person every three seconds or 10 million people per year are going to be dying from superbug infections. So that's more than motor vehicle accidents or cancer, for example. And that's a hundred million uh, or actually a hundred trillion dollars lost per year, mostly due to lost productivity because people are dying in the primes of their lives. Why aren't antibiotics doing their job any longer? Because I mean, at one time we thought that was you know, the super weapon against any kind of infection. The problem is, is that our misuse and overuse of antibiotics means that we are spreading antimicrobial resistance genes around the world. So just to give you an example, in Canada and in the U.S., about 80% or so of antibiotics are not just used in modern medicine. They're used in agriculture and in animal husbandry. And that's to make like animals like pigs and cows and chickens grow fatter faster. So in a sense, they're being used off label as growth promoters, even though that's illegal now in Canada and many other countries, it's still, um, there are loopholes. For example, um, people are supposed to be getting, uh, prescriptions in order to give their farm animals antibiotics, but there's no time limit to that prescription. There's nobody making sure that, um, antibiotics are, aren't used, um, when, you know, just when an animal is sick, for example. So, uh, so an animal could be getting antibiotics their whole life. And when you're using the same antibiotics in animals and on crops that you're using in people to cure their diseases, that's going to spread this, these antimicrobial resistance genes. So that's one of the biggest problems we have right now. The agribusiness lobby, for example, is, is you know, pushing against efforts from people like me and other um, concerned citizens who are trying to put a stop to this. I mean, math is the language of the universe. And when you're putting numbers like 5 million by 2050, 10 million, how can the lobbyists still have teeth? How is it possible that our the leaders are not just saying enough is enough, we have to stop doing this because those numbers are growing exponentially? There are multinational agencies like the UN and the WHO that have urged countries to have national action plans against antimicrobial resistance, but there's no accountability for them. Um, so for example, there are milestones that the U S has put forward, but if those milestones aren't met, there's, there's no penalty. So, uh, so that's a big problem. So what we really need to do is, is, you know, join forces. This is a global health problem. It needs a global health solution. This is, you know, um, a, a new antibiotic resistance gene that emerges in China, you know, the same month that my husband fell ill in 2015, it turns out that that gene was already in 30 countries. It's just nobody was watching and monitoring it. And that's part of the problem. So we really need to realize this isn't just an over there problem. It's here. It's right now. And Canada really uh, you know, needs to step up um, to uh, improve this, the situation as well. So I want to discuss the perfect predator and your race to save your husband from a superbug. The first thing I was listening to a lot of your different interviews. One was a book signing and your husband was talking about how much you two love to travel off the beaten path. So let's just share with us a little bit of your life before the superbug in terms of what you two would consider. Some people might think sitting on the beach for a week would be a vacation. That really wasn't your cup of tea, was it? No, I guess we're more of the adventure travel type, or at least we were um, prior to my husband's illness. We thought we might as well uh, do some of the exotic stuff while we're still young and able. Uh, for example, every year we go to Langara Island in Haida Gwaii for, uh, to salmon fish. For my husband's 65th birthday, he wanted to go to Timbuktu to see the Festival au Désert, which is the Malian uh, festival of the Tuareg people that play uh, this wonderful Tuareg music in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Um, we've been uh, to Papua New Guinea. The trip we took immediately before our fated uh, trip to Egypt was 
uh, to Rwanda, where we um, hiked up 9,000 feet to see the mountain gorillas. Yeah, we were very lucky that where he fell ill in Egypt, that we were able to get him medevaced um, first to Germany and then back home. Because if we'd been in Papua New Guinea, uh, for example, I don't think we would have been able to get him out of there to save his life. Our story began when we were on vacation in Egypt in 2015. We were exploring the pyramids, and Tom was as fit as a fiddle, or at least I thought so. Oh, sure, you know, he was overweight, but who doesn't have a few extra pounds? That didn't stop him from climbing 300 feet down backwards in the dark to explore a pyramid outside of Cairo. And it sounded like a perfect vacation, but almost in an instant, it changed on a dime. That's exactly right. So, yes, we were in Egypt. We um, had been to Cairo and um, Abu Simbel. And um, the last stop was in Luxor to see the Valley of the Kings. That was going to be the highlight of our trip. And um, we were the only ones on this cruise ship because there had been a terrorist attack in Sharm El Sheikh. And all the other Westerners canceled except us because Tom said, oh, it's the perfect time to go. No crowds. So I actually had handwritten you know, an addendum to our will before we left because I thought that we could be the victims of a kidnapping or something. I didn't think that the terror was going to come from within. Um, you know, he had this meal with me, um, this wonderful seafood meal on top of the cruise ship. And then a couple hours later, he was vomiting. He was just feeling terrible. Like he couldn't keep anything down. And I just assumed he had food poisoning. But it wasn't. It was actually a gallstone attack. So we found out later that a gallstone had lodged itself in his bile duct and it caused an abscess to form that he'd been walking around with for a while. But uh, that abscess made a nice little apartment for a superbug to move into. And so somewhere in Egypt, he acquired this superbug and it moved into that abscess and started multiplying. And so um, initially, you know, this gallstone attack um, caused pancreatitis and um, that's more is serious enough. But in, in the end of it, it was actually the superbug that was starting to kill him. And, um, you know, he was diagnosed with this pancreatitis um, in Egypt. And luckily, we had travel insurance um, that helped us get medevac first to Germany because he was too sick to make it home. You get him to Germany, so you know that this is serious. Did you ever imagine in your back then how serious this could be? Well, you know, I'm not a medical doctor. As an epidemiologist, I have a little bit of training in, you know, biology. And certainly I have an old degree in microbiology from the University of Toronto. But um, I've always thought that, you know, there's enough antibiotics to cure a bug that you pick up on vacation. Um, it never dawned on me that, a, um, you know, a bacterium that we used to plate on our Petri dishes back in 1986 in our class would end up being the number one most deadly bacterial pathogen to human health other than tuberculosis. I mean, this organism that we only needed to, you know, protect ourselves using a lab coat and gloves back in the 1980s now has superpowers. It's really good at stealing antibiotic resistance genes from other bacteria and from the environment. It can stick to hospital linens, even body lice. And it's it's prone to forming what's called biofilms. And in our book, I call those the microbial version of the Borg because there's a lot of cells and other like bacteria and, and they form this little microbial community. And it's very difficult for antibiotics to get through that, to kill the bacteria. So it turns out that the bacteria that he acquired was, you know, resistant to multiple antibiotics right off the bat. And it acquired even more resistance along the way, despite infection control. So, you know, there was no antibiotic that was going to kill it. And it was terrifying. In your book, you know, you described this bacteria, as you said, when you used to just deal with protecting yourself with a lab coat as wimpy. Yeah. How does it go from wimpy to this super bug in such a short period of time? The scientific term for these are called virulence factors. It's just like, imagine like there's different, like, you know, Marvel comics, there's different uh, super, you know, women and super men that have like, you know, different powers. But imagine one that has multiple powers, right? Being able to steal antibiotic resistance genes, being able to cloak itself with a slimy layer that protects, uh, uh, you know, antibiotics from getting in. This bacteria has just gotten super clever. And um, as you try to 
kill it, you know, using heavier and heavier antibiotics, uh, that's killing the friendly bacteria in the microbiome. And it's leaving more space for this bacteria to multiply and move in. So it was just like, yeah, sure, throw those antibiotics at us. That's not, that's not going to hurt us. And it's going to kill all the friendly bacteria. So that's actually one of the problems with antibiotics that wasn't first realized is that if you kill not just the bad bacteria, but the good bacteria as well, that that's not healthy for people. And so that's one of the reasons why bacteriophage are so attractive as an alternative. I guess the doctors in the hospital in Germany are kind of perplexed and you decide you're going to move them back to the States. How tough was that trip? Well, they weren't just perplexed. They were terrified. This was a a bacterium that has actually closed down whole hospitals because one of the characteristics of it was that it was found in the Middle East. It was prone to um, causing infections among veterans that had you know, been the victims of bomb blasts. And when they were being brought back home to Western Europe and the US, um, poor infection control in the military um, evacuation system led that bacterium to be populated all along the way. So the most common place to acquire this particular superbug is actually in hospitals as a result of that. So the German doctors knew that and it was a reportable condition. Um, they had to tell the their health authorities that they had a case of um, multi-drug resistant Acinetobacter bomanii is the official name, but it has the unfortunate nickname of being called Arachobacter because of, of the um, connotations with um, the wars in Iraq and, and Afghanistan. So um, yeah, they reported it to the to the health authorities, but when he got medevaced back to the U.S., it was not a reportable condition, even though it was even more resistant than it was in Germany. So that's another factor that has allowed superbugs to spread: is that you know we're not doing our jobs right um, if a, a, a bacterium like that is allowed to spread in hospitals, it can cause havoc because there's a lot of people that have cancer getting chemotherapy or have otherwise immune suppressed uh, immune systems. Yeah, it was terrible. Um, And by the time he got back home to uh, San Diego in our local hospital where, you know, it's our university hospital. So now my friends and colleagues are looking after him. I thought, okay, now he's going to get the care he needs and they'll be able to fix it because some of them were the top infectious disease doctors in the world. And they realized, oh man, like we can't operate on this guy because there's no antibiotics to cover it. If, if it gets into his bloodstream, he's going to die. What I understand is everything's shutting down and you two have had a agreement that a lot of couples saying, you know, don't keep me on life support if there's no hope. It comes down to him squeezing your hand. It was just um, a really strange and surreal moment because the doctors, my colleagues said, we don't think he's going to make it. Do you want to start kidney dialysis when the time comes? And that's really a veiled question because um, he was already on a ventilator to keep his lungs working. He couldn't breathe on his own. He was on three different medications called pressors to keep his heart pumping. So heart failure, lung failure, the the trifecta is kidney failure. So what they were saying is his kidneys are, are, you know, failing. Um, He's going to need dialysis to keep him alive. Do you want to do that? And if I said, you know, no, then he would have died. So I didn't know exactly what to do. This is like the pull the plug kind of moment. Right. And I decided to have a conversation with Tom to ask him what he wanted. And I said, you know, I know that you've been fighting really hard. I want to grow old with you. But if you are too tired and you want to give up, I'll understand. And if you want to live, though, squeeze my hand and I'll leave no stone unturned. And it was, um, you know, the most difficult conversation that I remember having with anybody. And um, after about a minute, he squeezed my hand really hard. And I was excited. I, you know, had my little blue glove and I fist pumped it in the air. And then I realized, oh, crap, like... I'm not a medical doctor. How am I going to do better than the colleagues that have been caring for him? But I thought, you know, if he dies, I want to know that I gave it my very best shot. So I went home and started doing research on my own. And you uncovered something that I talked about when I opened this episode saying it not only saved Tom's life, but potentially millions of others. So it's Chatter That Matters. When we return, Stephanie keeps her promise 
and she leaves no stone unturned. Her amazing yet ancient discovery is next. It's Tony Chapman from Chatter That Matters. I asked Canadians about their money matters. We talked debt, inflation, interest rates, and many were worried and some felt they could lose everything. In response, RBC has created My Money Matters. It's a site where you gain financial knowledge. You learn how to manage debt, reduce stress. There's even tools and apps to help you deal with the realities of today. Visit rbc.com slash money matters. Your financial well-being matters to you and to RBC. I'm an HIV researcher in my working life, and I never would have expected to say that viruses have become our best allies against bacteria. I know that, you know, my experience has moved the field forward. I'm hoping that if I can save one life because of my experience, that it's been all worthwhile. You're listening to Chatter That Matters with Tony Chapman, presented by RBC. Today I'm speaking to Stephanie Strathdee. What she did to save her husband and potentially millions of others is truly what matters. What did you uncover with Tom surrounded with the best infectious disease doctors? How did you possibly stumble on something that other people had missed? Well, I am a scientist. I was well-trained at the University of Toronto. I know how to do a literature search. And I did find a paper that mentioned alternative treatments for the superbug that he had that, you know, and one of them was called phage therapy or short for bacteriophage. And at that same day that I stumbled across this and it was kind of like, I'm thinking, wow, I know what phage are. I remember learning about those in my virology class in 1986. A colleague of mine from University of California, San Francisco sent me a a message saying, you know, I don't normally pass on things like this, but a friend of mine had a superbug infection and went to Tbilisi, Georgia, where she had something called phage therapy. And it cured her. And I thought, wow, maybe this is a sign. At this point, I was grasping at straws. But I also, um, another kind of strange element of this story is that a colleague of mine that I've known for years is Robert Lindsay Milne. He's a, a psychic intuitive counselor. He's based in Toronto. And he had gotten in touch with me um, before we went to Egypt and said, hey, it's been a long time since we've chatted. Do you want to touch base? And what he was really telling me that is he saw something that was going to happen. <laughs> So I didn't get in touch with him before we went to Egypt. But when Tom fell sick, I reached out to him. And when I told him that I'd stumbled across this thing called phage therapy, he said it was like an electric shock. Um, And this is a guy who has not finished high school. Okay, so he doesn't have a scientific background. He goes, "Okay, wait a second. He says, are phage like little Pac-Men that would gobble up bacteria? And I went, yeah, you can think of them like that. I mean, they're viruses that have naturally evolved to attack bacteria. So they're found in nature and they are like little Pac-Men. And he said, you know what? You got to pursue this because I've always believed that Tom isn't going to die. It's not his time. And maybe if this is the thing that's going to work, it's not just going to save his life. It's going to save millions of people. And I kind of laughed. <laughs> To be honest, you know, like I am a scientist, but here I am consulting a psychic. But, you know, this guy has never really steered me wrong. And I needed hope and I needed inspiration. Then I asked the head of infectious diseases at UC San Diego, who was my colleague who was helping care for Tom. I said, what do you think of phage therapy? And he said, what an interesting and intriguing idea. If it might be ahead of its time, but it turns out it was really a hundred years <laughs> before that this had been discovered. It's just that it had been forgotten therapy in the West. He said, if you can find phages that will be a match for Tom's bacteria, I will call the FDA and see if we can get permission to give it to him on a compassionate basis. And that really isn't as simple as it sounds, because as you said, this was untried unresearched and you're having, I think the gentleman was Chip Schooley, right? He said, I'm w- I'm willing to do this. Everything in science comes to reputation. So this is remarkable. He does that. So what happens next? Well, I started doing more research on phage and yes, there actually had been research. It's just that, um, you know, phage were discovered before the first um, antibiotic penicillin. And so the early research on it wasn't that great. And the other thing that happened is that um, in the 1930s, the first phage therapy Institute 
was erected in what is now Tbilisi, Georgia. And the guy who discovered phage, um, Felix de Harel, a French Canadian self taught microbiologist, he helped set that program up. Because this is leading up to World War II, phage got this reputation of being a Soviet medicine a, that was an enemy. They called it, you know, pink Okami science. And that's one of the reasons it was forgotten. But in the meantime, a lot of research was being done on phage because it helped scientists uncover um, life processes. So, for example, phage helped, um, you know, start the whole field of molecular biology, um, cancer treatments, CRISPR-Cas gene editing. All of those are phage scientists. It's just that the application of phage for therapeutic purposes was forgotten because of this Russian taint. So it turns out there's actually 10 million trillion trillion or a non-alien. That's 10 to the power of 31 phages that are thought to be on the planet. And you need to find the right phages to knock out the bacteria that you're trying to kill. So that was the daunting part. But, um, you know, it wasn't like I could go out and do this myself. I didn't know how to do this. This was all brand new. Um, so I went back to the internet, made a list of, of researchers that I thought were close enough that they might be able to help who were studying phage and, and um, lo and behold, some total strangers from Texas A&M university responded immediately and said that if I could send Tom's bacterial isolate to them, that they would turn their lab into a command center and try to find some phages that would help. When you're talking about numbers like that, that's like the smallest needle in almost every haystack stacked together. Yeah. Turning the lab into command center, was there just a lot of luck involved or did they at least have a process where they could start narrowing the field and saying with his bacteria, this might be an area that we should start looking at first? Well, it was a bit of both. I mean, certainly all the planets needed to line up in order to find phage that were a match for Tom's isolate in time to save his life, right? Because Tom was dying. And every day that passed, you know, he lost, lost more and more weight. He was totally in a deep coma, couldn't squeeze anybody's hand anymore. But, you know, the lab at Texas A&M, uh, led by Rye Young at the time, um, you know, they had these environmental samples um, and essentially they these were sourced from sewage, barnyard waste, um, all sorts of crap, literally crap. Um, and that's because wherever you find a lot of bacteria, you find the perfect predator, the phage that will kill them. So literally, we sourced phage from sh to save my husband's life. I, I just couldn't believe it. But so they found four phages that were a match for Tom's bacterial isolate within a couple of weeks. Uh, a graduate student slept in the lab, in the lab to be able to find this. And, um, in the meantime, um, Dr. Schooley turned to the FDA and said, Hey, we've got this guy who's going to die unless, um, we can try something outside the box. Could you allow us to? give him these phage that are a match for his isolate. The FDA knew all about phage therapy to Chip's surprise. And they also knew that the um, army and Navy were working on phage. And so they helped connect Chip to both of them. And the army said, no, we're not going to get involved in the care of, for a civilian. But the arm, the Navy said, Hmm, you know, this one Lieutenant commander, Theron Hamilton, um, who is a dead ringer for Tom Cruise. <laughs> he said, if you send me his bacterial isolate, I'll see if uh, our collection of phages that we've sourced from the bilges of ships around the world would match Tom's isolate. And they found four phages that were matched. So now we had two phage cocktails that were prepared within three weeks. Now compare that to an antibiotic that takes 10 to 15 years to develop and a price tag of a billion dollars or more. No comparison. I mean, there is a danger though, right? When you're, you're putting this into the body. I mean, I think you read in your book that there's certain risks if it gets into the bloodstream and such. So how do you, with sort of this hundred year old science, but somewhat forgotten, you know, labeled sort of this, you know, commie medicine, how do you st know that what you're putting in or did it matter? It was life or death. So we're going to try anything. So we didn't have the experience with phage therapy in the U.S. to know whether or not this was safe. Um, Chip consulted with researchers from um, Georgia, who one of whom was now in Brussels, where there was a nascent 
phage therapy program at the Royal Astrid Military Hospital and got some advice on how to treat him. Um, and what we learned is that there's something called endotoxin. When you're growing these phage up, like you're essentially having an incubator, imagine a, a giant test tube of bacteria and phage um, going at it. It's like, uh, you know, World War Three in there, but you can't see it. And the bacteria are being killed by the phage. You know, it's a process that will go on and on and on. And so um, what happens is the, the bacterial cell wall bursts, right? Because the phage burst out and they go on to attack new bacteria. And the broken pieces of that bacterial cell wall actually will be toxic to humans. So um, you've got to try to remove as much of that toxin as you can. And there's different ways to do that. Um, and that's what took most of the time of the three weeks that it took to get these phage preparations ready was trying to scrub these phage preparations to remove as much um, toxin as possible. We didn't really know if we'd lowered it enough because he'd already already had six cases of septic shock. If he had another one, he was going to die. It was very scary though, because I really didn't know if we were going to cure him or kill him, but I knew that he was going to die within hours if we didn't try something. So it was just um, a Hail Mary pass. And how do you feel making that choice? Because as you said, he would have died, but if I gave him this and he died suddenly, have you ever come to terms with how you would have felt knowing that that was the cocktail that, that put him there? Well, you know, you've actually put your finger on the most difficult moment. Um, my husband was in the hospital for nine months and I was at his side every day. Um, and the most difficult time was when we decided that, yes, we were going to treat him intravenously with phage. And that would carry greater risks um, of the septic shock if the endotoxin level was too high. And see, what readers need to know is that, um, you know, Tom has two adult children from his first marriage, and they're, they were my stepchildren, right? I had power of attorney, so it was me making this decision. I consulted them, and they gave me their blessing. But if if I killed him with some experimental cockamamie treatment, um, they would have never forgiven me. And that weight on my shoulders was the most pressing, scary thing I've ever experienced. How did it feel when they, I don't know if this is the right medical term, but turn on the tap and that IV starts pouring into their, his blood? How, were you there for that moment? I was there when we started infusing the phages into him intravenously. And that was the scariest part. Um, and, it, you know, he had what's called a pick line. So they were infusing other things like IV fluids. And, you know, still they were giving him antibiotics, even though they knew that those weren't working anymore. So they just added the phage preparation into that line. So it was kind of anticlimactic because, you know, it felt like something should be happening, like some lightning bolt or whatever. And, and, you know, and then you just wait. There wasn't little Pac-Man coming out of the IV no, no, machine. There was no, oh, yeah. there was no little Pac-Man. No. That you could, no. But I imagined them like that. I mean, I actually, and, and Robert I was in touch with me at that time. And he said, visualize these as, you know, little things going after these bacteria. And so lo and behold, you know, three days after we started intravenous phage therapy, Tom woke up from what is called in medicine as multi-stage organ failure liver, kidneys, heart, lungs, they're all going. He's dying. He opened his eyes, uh, lifted his head off the pillow, and his daughter Carly was there, and he kissed her hand. And like everybody in the ICU just flipped out. Nobody could believe that, you know, that this had happened. I wasn't there at that particular moment. Um, we were on shift around the clock as a vigil to be with him. And the next day I went in to see him and he'd actually lapsed into a coma again. Everybody thought it was the phages that were doing it. We stopped the phage temporarily, but it turns out it was another bacteria that had enters his bloodstream. And so we had antibiotics for that one, thank God. And we started the phage therapy again. So that was another moment where it was like, okay, his daughters are turning to me going, are you sure you want to do this? Like he just had, you know, another case of septic shock. And we said, yes, we're going to do this. And that from that moment on, he made, you know, a, a started to make a complete recovery. What you have to realize is that when you're lying in the hospital bed and you're not moving for every month that you're lying there, it takes five months to recover from. So nine months times five, that's like it's almost four years. 
Yes, exactly. So he's, he's actually sitting in the room here with me right now. He's just come back from a three mile walk. Um, he's doing great. We travel again, um, except when COVID is raging. You know, he's had as near a complete recovery as you can, um, despite having, you know, such a, a, a terrible ordeal. How's it? And maybe we should get Tom on to answer this question, but I'm curious because I've had people on my show that have knocked at death's door and now they view life in a very different way. It's an experience they never asked for or wanted, but it's also in, inside that experience is a gift of realizing that time is fragile and to make the most of it. Is that the case with Tom? Tom says that um, this is practice <laughs> and that, you know, when the real time comes, he'll be ready. Um, and we, we both just treasure every moment that we have together um, as a result of this. And, you know, we also realize how privileged we were to have the connections and the resources to be able to, you know, get a, a global village around the world to step up and, and save the life of a stranger. So that's why we decided to write our book, The Perfect Predator, because if this blindsided me as an infectious disease epidemiologist, you, you know, you would think that somebody like me would, you know, know how terrible the superbug crisis was. It, it had crept up on me. So the average person isn't aware of this doesn't know that phage therapy is a potential, you know, cure. And, um, and it needed, you know, a jumpstart for clinical research and clinical trials to get going. And so that's really what's happened since our, our book was published in 2016 and his uh, case report was published. There has been just this resurgence in phage therapy research and also other people who are, um, you know, close to death are getting phage therapy as a direct result of Tom's case. And I've met many of them and it's really awe inspiring to know that, you know, something that, turned out, you know, you thought was the worst thing that had ever happened to you ends up saving other people's lives. It's really been a gift. How much of a dent do you think Phage can put into those numbers that you shared earlier? 5 million this year might die from superbugs, 10 million by 2050. Is Phage the superhero to take on these superbugs? Well, Phage have been duking it out with bacteria for almost 4 billion years, right? They are actually the gatekeepers in our microbiome. They're already in our bodies, right? Keeping the bacterial numbers in check. So if we were able to harness that power of nature to reduce antibiotic use and misuse, not just in modern medicine, but in veterinary medicine, animal husbandry, agriculture, I think, yes, it could make a huge difference. We also see that a phage is synergistic at times with antibiotics. So um, we don't think they're ever going to replace antibiotics fully, but they can be used so that you don't have to use as much antibiotics as before. Before. And then also with this CRISPR-Cas gene editing revolution, there are teams, even teams in Canada, that are actually, you know, making phage better killers. So using genetic engineering, there's a company in Manitoba that's actually making synthetic phage and say that they can actually make um, a phage product within 30 days of receiving the bacterial isolate. So all of those things are super exciting. And um, that's what we need to invest in is more research uh, because you can't just take an experimental treatment and give it um, out willy nilly, right? You've got to do the clinical trials and that takes time. I'm going to start with you personally, and then I'm going to talk to you as a scientist. But you personally, obviously you've got your science credentials. You've also got a side to you that you're open to what a psychic might have to say to you. How about spirituality? Has this all changed you as an individual? Because yes, it's modern medicine and ancient medicine, but there has to be some element you thinking there was a miracle involved as well, given how serious he was and how fast all these coincidences came together to create something that allows him to go on a three mile walk today. You're right. Um, I do believe that it was a, a miracle for all of the things to line up in order to save Tom's life and time. Science was certainly a big part of it. Um, and the kindness of strangers was certainly a part of it, but there was more than just chance. Um, in my view, I, you know, I, some people call it God. I do believe that there was an element of that. It's just hard to know, but I'm just grateful. And um, that's one of the reasons why I tell our story and, you know, writing and doing interviews like this, because we feel that this is the reason we're on the planet. Is this become your total focus because you were doing so much good in so many other areas? And I'm sure you're pulled in so many different ways. 
But have you just really said that this is a calling that, that I've been given and that's really what I'm going to pursue as long as I can? Well, actually, I'm doing both. So I still have my day job. I'm an HIV prevention researcher. Um, I've expanded that work into the response for to COVID, for example, and MPOX. Um, so that's what I'm trained to do. I'm not trained to be a phage researcher or a virologist or even a medical doctor. But I um, I am the public face for our center. We have a nonprofit center at UC San Diego called the Center for Innovative Phage Applications and Therapeutics. And we help people get phage therapy on a compassionate basis. Um, but we're also simultaneously moving phage into clinical trials. So we are involved in several different clinical trials right now. You know, Stephanie, I always end my show on my three takeaways. And the first one and I visualize a lot of what people say, and I can imagine what it must have felt like to have your hand be squeezed and squeezed hard. And you have putting a fist pump up and then going, well, what am I supposed to do with this? And then the second thing is how many people rallied. And I think often when you animate a dream, a desired outcome, when people believe in something, it's amazing what we can do in a positive way. And the amount of people that have rallied to your cause along the way, I think is just a tribute to the fact that you refuse to give up. And we always talk about the need for an advocate in medicine. And I think you were more than an advocate, you were a warrior. And the third thing is just how relaxed you are telling this story and using words like kindness, words that maybe because of Hollywood, you don't normally attribute to a scientist who wants to have all the I's dotted and the T's crossed. But that kindness, I think, allowed you to make some very tough mission critical decisions, knowing that on one shoulder was the two stepdaughters who would never forgive you if you made a bad call. It's just really a beautiful story. And it really comes down to, yeah, you must have one of the biggest brains I've ever talked to, but I think your heart's even bigger. Well, that's that's very kind of you, but I don't want to take all the credit. In fact, I want all your listeners to know that there is a Phage Canada now. Um, it just got launched at the University of Toronto, my alma mater. Uh, Dr. Greg German is leading it up. Uh, a $5 million donation from an anonymous donor came in to get it started. You know, I'm really happy to have been a part of the people behind um, that we're cheering for this. And so people don't have to come to the U.S. or contact us at all. They can go to Greg German to get this in Canada. Faye John. I was raised Anglican, but I'm spiritual, not religious. I know that so many positives come with belonging to a community, believing in shared values and good over evil. Still, history has proved that this is also a feeding ground for power, ambition, manipulation, corruption, deception, and all that can be harnessed and harvested from blind faith. My congregation is made up of every human who wants peace and prosperity. Every color, religion, gender, orientation are included. Here it's more of a meeting of the hearts versus our minds. We dream of a better life for our children and safety, security, freedom, and prosperity for all. But sadly, we've become the silent majority as we've surrendered power to too few. And our dreams are becoming nightmares as we look around and see a world increasingly divided by those who commit horrific crimes against humanity in the name of their gods or political beliefs. They fuel their ambitions with hatred and seed their ideology where it has no place. It's time for us to show our strengths in numbers. I invite Christians and Muslims and Jews and Hindus and Buddhists and secular Sikh spiritualists and every other religion in the world to come together as a human race. Let's each light a candle to remind ourselves that light can triumph over darkness and that acceptance, empathy, and respect are values to illuminate a safe and prosperous path to the future. Chatter That Matters has been a presentation of RBC. Happy holidays, everyone. It's Tony Chapman. Thank you for listening to Chatter That Matters. And let's chat soon.